Spatial Inequality in Mexico City from Shacks to Skyscrapers, Part 2. Rural decline causes urban migration. Juan Ortiz and his family live in a small village in central Mexico, and like his father and grandfather before him, he is a farmer. He grows corn, beans, and other vegetables on a few acres of land that his family owns, but conditions have declined in the countryside. Juan can no longer support his family by farming, and now he is forced to seek other work. Like many farmers, Juan plans to leave his village and move to the city, making him part of the large urban migration caused by rural decline in Mexico. Life for most Mexican farmers is tough. Only about 15% of the land in Mexico is suitable for farming, while the rest is too dry, rocky, or mountainous to grow crops. In addition, a small number of wealthy landowners own most of the best farmland in Mexico. There are several types of farms in Mexico. One type is the small, privately owned farm. Another type is the larger farm on communal land, or ejido, which is owned by a community of farmers who work the land. A third type of farm is a large commercial farm that grows food for export. At one time, small farmers were the backbone of Mexican society, but now they are finding it difficult to survive. To compete with large farms, they have to increase their production. However, they lack the money to buy seeds, fertilizer, and farm machinery, so many ultimately end up selling their land. Sometimes they go to work for wages on the large farms, but some jobs are few and offer low wages. As a result, poverty and unemployment have increased in rural Mexico. Faced with rural decline, many farmers choose to migrate to the city. There, they hope to find jobs that will pay them a decent wage and provide their families with a higher standard of living. They also hope their children will have an opportunity to get a good education in city schools so that they can escape the cycle of poverty and find skilled jobs later. For years, most rural migrants headed to Mexico City, with migration rates peaking during the 1970s and 1980s. Since then, that rate has declined as life in Mexico City has become more difficult. Many migrants now choose to move to other cities in Mexico while some try to cross the border into the United States. Here is a graph showing the percentage of urban and rural residents in Mexico over time. In 1950, more Mexicans lived in rural areas than in cities, but that has changed by 1960. Today, around 80% of all Mexicans live in cities. The graph also shows estimates for the future. So we can see that in 1950, it was about 42-43% people who lived in urban area, and the other 60-some percent lived in the rural area. But 10 years later, it about evened itself out, so half the population were in rural and half were in urban areas. As we continue gaining years, we see that the red line for urban is pushing the green line for rural away. We can see that in 2020, the year we're at right now, they had estimated that it would be about 80% people living in urban areas and about 20% people still living in rural areas. Urbanization creates new problems. Julio Cesar Cu is a professional diver, but he does not go diving in the ocean. Instead, he dives under the streets of Mexico City. On work days, Julio puts on a, small, a special diving suit and swims into the city's giant sewer system to remove trash and other objects from sewer pipes. Once, he even found half a car. It's a nasty job, but someone has to do it. Mexico City's sewers are overloaded, and this is just one of the problems caused by rapid urbanization. 
You have read that rural migration is a key factor in Mexico City's growth. Large families have likewise played a part. Since the 1990s, however, both migration from rural areas and the number of children in the average family have declined. As a result, the city is growing slower than it once did. In spite of this decreased growth rate, Mexico City is continuing to expand, with its suburbs spreading up the sides of the mountains that surrounded the Valley of Mexico. Newcomers are also filling in areas that were once covered by the valley's lakes, which were drained long ago to enable expansion. However, there is still not enough land or housing for the city's growing population. Urbanization and overcrowding have caused problems in Mexico City. Clean water is in short supply, making sanitation difficult and aiding the spread of disease. Roads are clogged with traffic, polluting the air, and making it difficult for people to travel from one place to another. Buses and subways are also packed. Mexico City is bursting at the seams. Rapid growth has negatively affected Mexico City's environment. One of the city's worst problems is air pollution. Years ago, residents had a clear view of two great snow-capped volcanoes that are located just east of the city, but now the mountains are rarely visible. A thick blanket of smog often hangs over the city, sometimes making it difficult just to see across the street. Because of poor air quality, many city residents suffer from asthma and other illnesses. On some days, the air is so bad that schools are closed and people are warned to avoid going outside. Although recent laws to limit pollution have helped, the problem persists. Social problems have also grown with urbanization. There are not enough jobs in the city to keep everyone employed, so poverty has increased. When poverty rises, crime does as well. Mexico City was once a relatively safe place to live, but now many residents fear for their safety. Here we have a few maps showing the growth of Mexico City from 1950 to 2014. About one-sixth of Mexicans live in Mexico City. The urban area once lay entirely within the borders of the city itself, but has since spread well beyond those boundaries. Much of this great growth consists of poor neighborhoods. So we can see in Mexico City in 1950 at the top, there was just this little blob, little, right here, little blob. In 1980, just 30 years later, well, our little blob has expanded. And in 2014, 34 years later, I think, our blob has gotten like quadruple a size like it's super tiny and now it's super big so people have been moving into mexico city and expanding the urban area outside of just the city borders over 60 some years a city of haves and have nots sylvia martinez lives in one of mexico city's huge garbage dumps she sorts through piles of trash to find bits of glass, metal, and other materials that she can recycle for cash. She is one of the millions of have-nots in Mexico City. The have-nots, poor people who have little money and few possessions, make up the majority of the city's population. In contrast, the haves are people with money and comfortable lives. The differences between these two groups reflect the spatial inequalities of Mexico City. The have-nots struggle to survive. The poorest of the have-nots are typically recent migrants to the city who often live in slums on the edge of town. Most houses in these slums are small shacks made of scrap metal and other refuse. Some of these houses lack electricity and running water. The streets of the slums are often unpaved and littered with trash, and many people who live in these slum areas have little or no work. 
migrants who have been in the city for a while may live in somewhat better conditions. Most have some kind of work and many have multiple jobs, often working as maids, dishwashers, cooks, construction workers, street vendors, or bus drivers. Still, even migrants who have found a job end up working long hours for little pay. To make things worse, they may have to travel for hours by public transportation to get to their jobs. Recent arrivals are not the only people in Mexico City who are poor. Many city residents are working poor, which means that they have jobs that are too low paying to lift them out of poverty. Most working poor live in working class neighborhoods that are usually closer to the center of the city than the slums. Some live in cinder block homes with metal or tar covered roofs, while others live in large tenements or run down apartment buildings. Houses in working class neighborhoods generally have electricity, but some lack running water. The streets are usually paved, though they are often poor repair. While their lives are better than those of recent migrants, the working poor of Mexico City still face many struggles and uncertainties as they try to stay employed and provide for their families. The Haves Live Well The Haves are members of Mexico City's middle and upper class. They make up approximately one-fourth of the city's residents. A very small percentage of the haves belong to the upper class. These extremely wealthy people are large landowners or leaders in business or government. They enjoy a luxurious standard of living, many living on large castle lake-like estates with high walls and security systems. They often hire the working poor as their maids, gardeners, and drivers. Members of the middle class live in houses or apartment buildings near the center of the city or in modern suburbs farther away. Many work in business, education, or government. They can usually afford some luxuries such as smartphones. Moreover, many middle-class families have enough income that they can afford to pay for meals out, entertainment, and education. In recent years, the Mexican middle class has expanded, and it is expected to continue to grow. Although around 47% of the nation's households are middle class, falling back into poverty is a risk for many. In the first half of the 2010s, Mexico's poverty rate actually increased. Moreover, wealth and inequality remains, with around 10% of the population holding 65% of the wealth. Shacks like the one seen here are located in slums on the outskirts of Mexico City. Houses are made of scrap wood and metal and sometimes use tarps for a roof. The people who live in these areas are often recent migrants to the city. Many end up selling cheap goods on the street or begging for a living. So when we mentioned that people who lived in the slum neighborhoods and these little shacks that can be, I guess, called houses, and we mentioned that they don't have running water, they don't typically have electricity, the streets aren't really paved. This is what it looks like. Kind of torn down, very small, and they're all clumped together. In contrast, this is a home located in a wealthy area of Mexico City. Homes like this often have large gardens and many rooms. They may also have security systems to guard against crime. Only a tiny portion of the city's population can afford to live like this. So in contrast to the last picture, this one definitely looks like it has running water, probably enough to maybe even have a pool. It looks like a kind of house that would have a pool. You have electricity. It probably will have gates leading up to it. So there's a very, very stark difference in between 
the small houses and the slum areas and the rich and the wealthy areas. Very large difference. And it's all in the same city. It's like living, if you live where you, where you live, and on one side of the street, you see all these houses clumped together, and on the other side of the street, you see a giant mansion, super high, like leaning over, impeding over you. So throughout these lessons, we learned about spatial inequality in Mexico City. We read how rural decline has increased migration to cities and learned about problems that have come with rapid urbanization. We've also seen how the rich and poor have very different standards of living. These differences are clear in housing, transportation, and many other aspects of city life. Spatial inequality does not exist only in large cities, but also in any area where differences in wealth affect how people live. You can observe such differences in standard of living in small towns as well as in suburbs and cities. Spatial inequality also exists on a global scale. Think about global spatial inequality as you examine the map in the next section. The map compares the standard of living measured by life expectancy, level of education, and per capita GDP of people and countries around the world. Global Connections This map below compares how well people live around the world. The rankings are based on a measure of living standards known as the Human Development Index, or HDI. The HDI looks at how countries are doing in terms of their economics, societies, and basic living standards. The HDI encompasses data on the life expectancy, education level, and gross, gross national income, or GNI, per capita the total income of a country's residents and businesses divided by the country's population. So how much money the whole country's residents and business makes divided by how many people are in that country. Why do some countries have a higher HDI rank than might be expected? The blue circles on the map indicate countries that rank higher on the HDI than their GNI per capita alone might lead you to think. In these cases, other factors reflected in the HDI, like life expectancy and education, might push their HDI rank higher. Often in these countries, the differences between rich and poor are not great. Also, some of these countries provide education and health care to all of their citizens. Okay, but why do some countries have a lower HDI rank than might be expected? The countries marked by a red square rank lower in the HDI than you might expect based on their GNI per capita. In such countries, there is likely to be a large gap between rich and poor. While the rich live well, the poor have limited access to education and health care. How do patterns of spatial inequality change over time? Each year, the HDI ranks some of the countries increase as living standards in these countries improve. At the same time, the ranks of other nations decline. Often such changes reflect government policies. In Zimbabwe, for example, decisions by the government have harmed the economy, and as a result, living standards have declined. In Malaysia, government policies have helped raise living standards. So here's the map we were discussing above. The standard of living around the world in 2017. So this map is about two to three years old now, but it's as recent as we can get. And remember, we're ranking based on a measure of living standards known as the Human Development Index. We can see right over here, ooh, it zooms in very much, Human Development Index rank. It tells us if it's very high, high, medium, low, or if we don't have any current information on it. 
As we can see, we don't have many current information in Antarctica, in Somalia, and in Greenland, which is part of Denmark, which is over here somewhere. Denmark. And also remember, to find out the Human Development Index, we have to take into account the data on life expectancy, so how long people live, their education level, and the gross national income per capita. Remembering that that's all the income, the population, um, the residents and businesses in that country make divided by how much people, how many people are in that country. So if we look at the places that are kind of pink, these are our places with very high human development index. And our places that are purple are places that are lower on the scale. If we look at the countries with the blue circles, we can see we have some here, we have Cuba, Haiti, Venezuela, some over here like Georgia, Turkey, I think that's uh, Moldova and Ukraine. These countries rank higher on the HDI than their GNI per capita might make you think. But that's because they're looking at the life expectancy and the education as well. So the life expectancy in Turkey, for example, and the education in Turkey might be higher than their HDI, than their um, GNI would be. And some places have a little, uh, little red square. So you see we have, I think that goes to Trinidad and Tobago. We've got, let's, I can't even read these, Nigeria, Sudan, Bhutan, Brunei. Saudi Arabia, all these places with the red stuff, with the red, um, red squares rank lower than you might expect based on their GNI per capita. So what that means is that there's probably a very, very big difference in these places between their wealthiest people and their poorest people. Crazy to think.